Good morning, Flowers and Wine. Um, this is the Romance panel. We have four uh, fantastic authors I'm going to introduce here. Um, so uh, we'll begin today with Robin Nix. Robin lives in England, but enjoys traveling all over the world in search of inspiration. She loves to create complex characters to weave into stories that remind us of the darker side of human nature in the hope that we might cultivate the light. Robin's debut novel, Never Enough, received critical praise from Publishers Weekly and Music City Dreamers, was a recommended January romance read by the mainstream international media and news organizations. NPR, Rebecca S. Buck, um, is from Naughty, and currently lives just outside the city on the same street as world famous writer Gage Lawrence, um, where he spent his teenage years. She has written four novels and one short story collection with bold strokes, all of them involving both romance and history. And she's also a reviewer, blogger, and art writer, and has just become the dear editor for Nottingham's Left Lion Arts Magazine. And Corinne Claxton is the author of the vampire novel Scarlet Thirst, and the award winning Ghost Mysteries, The Supernatural Detective, and Death's Doorway. Corinne lives in London, writing novels and lighting shows for theater. And she'll be reading from Supernatural Detective. And finally, Miller <coughs> is an English literature graduate with passion for LGBT heritage. She has a master's degree in museum studies. And the word and visual imagination has, and has written and curated a permanent exhibition of LGBT voices and memorabilia based at Leipzig's LGBT Center. And his debut novel, Highland Fling, was a finalist in the 2018 Golden Crown Literary Society Awards and was recommended as one of the top 10 summer reads of 2017 by After Ellen. So I'm reading from Music City Dreamers, which is at the back, available for Coachase. Music City Dreamers is my first and possibly my only foray into pure romance. <laughs> um, I didn't write it for the market, it came from a character from Changing Time, which is the second of my extractor series. This scene we're dropping in on the Bluebird Cafe, famous if you know anything about country music, um, and it's where the, the two main characters first meet. <laughs> Heather glanced at the other occupant of Gage's table, and warmth wrapped itself around her body like a blanket of undiluted desire. The person stood and smiled knowingly, as if acutely aware of the universal appeal. Their eyes promised an explosive encounter, but there was a clear non-physical barrier that guarded their heart and would offer nothing more. Perhaps precisely what Heather needed after two years of career-controlled celibacy. The cool night breeze slipped through the open door and traversed her spine with the feather-like touch of a familiar lover. Please God be a woman. I'm Louie. The moniker was inconclusive, but the soft tone of her voice made it clear Louie was a woman. The lack of an Adam's apple as Louis lifted her chin to reveal a faintly tanned and slender neck was additional proof. Heather found herself wanting to trace her tongue along it and taste Louis's skin. She reluctantly pulled herself from her absorbing fantasy to acquiesce to social etiquette and held out her hand. Louis took it, far gentler than Gay, and kissed her knuckles. Heather was struck by the chivalrous nature of the gesture and had to stop herself from giggling. Was this what she'd been missing out on by just dating high fans? I'm going to be reading from Ghost of Winter, which looks like that, and there is a pile of them at the back, coincidentally. Um, the context is winter is actually a manor house, a stately home in the north of England, and my main character, Ross, has inherited it. It's in a bit of a state, so she needs to get an architect in to help her renovate the house. That architect is Anna, who is very beautiful, um, and there's some romance developing, and um, it's Christmas, it's snowy outside, um, Ross is entirely expecting to spend Christmas entirely on her own in an empty house and then Anna turns up and brings the wine and some other gifts and that's where we are now. So, I clinked my glass against hers. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We each took a sip of our wine. My taste buds were dazzled by a sweet spicy fruitiness, silky and smooth on my tongue. What do you think of my choice? She asked, watching my reaction. It's delicious, I told her. You should be getting apricots, dried nuts and cinnamon. She paused and raised an eyebrow as she waited for my reaction. 
When I just stared at her and wondered what to say, her face relaxed and she laughed. So if I'm honest, I got that from the label. As much as I enjoy a good wine, I can't place the flavours. No, that would just be pretentious, I said wryly. Yes, just like shopping at Harrods, she said in the same tone. I took another sip of the wine and noticed she was drinking hers rather quickly. The unusual excitement emanating from her made it seem there was something more she wanted to say. A pleasant tension with none of the awkwardness there had been between us before hung in the air. I was about to tell her to take a seat, since she had been standing since she entered, when my eyes fell on that plastic bag she had been carrying, which now rested on the bottom step of the staircase. I looked at her with curiosity. So, what's in the bag? My other gift? Tony is the uh, central character and she sees ghosts and sol helps them solve problems, crimes often. And her love interest is a medical herbalist called Maya. And the other character you need to know for this short scene is Deirdre, who is her uh, Tony's spirit guide. And she's a drag queen who died in the 1980s and wears 1980s outfits often. So at the point that I'm going to read to you, Tony and Deirdre have been visiting a ghost in hospital. Well, visiting a, a live person in hospital associated with a ghost. They've just solved something there. And Maya is coincidentally <coughs> visiting the hospital. Outside the main entrance, Deirdre stopped in front of Tony. You can't take diazepam. You have public responsibilities now, she said sharply, straightening her pencil skirt and tugging at her black seamed tights so that the lines at the back of her legs ran vaguely in a line. Tony walked off to the side, away from the bustle of patients, visitors and medics. Are the ghosts, are ghosts the public? They're not very public, are they? I think it'd be more accurate to refer to ghosts as the private, she wondered. Anyway, what am I supposed to do if it all gets to be too much? I have a life, you know, and work and friends. You have work and maybe one friend, but you hardly have a life. Possibly you have a half-life, but that's stretching it. And what you do is to use me to channel the others. That's my job. You weren't there, Tony pointed out. For five minutes? For five days? I'm a ghost, it's all the same, Deirdre said unhelpfully. Tony's gut churned. Something was going to fall. Somebody she cared about was going to get hurt, crushed beneath bricks and wood and metal bars. She tore her head round to see Maya, about 50 metres away, standing under a building covered with scaffolding. Fear knifing through her body, she took off towards her. Maya strolled through the entrance to outpatients towards the car park, stopping short at the sight of Tony. She was standing near the doors to the main hospital, talking to somebody out of view around the corner. Pulse racing, Maya decided she was going to go over and ask Tony out to dinner. Maybe it wasn't sensible to see someone who made her heart beat as hard as a hammer, but Maya was done with being sensible. Life is short, she reminded herself. Very excited to introduce my second novel, a contemporary romance called Love Portrait. Okay, don't guess so, what's Love Portrait all about? Okay, It's a slow burn, romantic contemporary romance heartbreaking and heartwarming legal measure. Main character Molly Good is optimistic, quirky and a little bit awkward. She drives a vintage yellow mini, the temperament of Daisy May, has a passion for art, red wine and peanut butter. <laughs> At a museum job, a new museum job, she is tasked by her boss, the formidable Evelyn Fox, to find out the provenance of her painting of a beautiful woman brought in by the smoking hot investment banker Georgina Wright. Georgina, grieving, following the recent death of her father, opens her heart to Molly as they uncover the painting's poignant hidden history of a love lost in the 1830s. Love's portrait is about the dilemma of falling for someone you work for. It's about sticking up for your principles. It's about making your voice heard. It's about also my very real love for art and museums and my passion for challenging the invisibility of lesbians in history, something I care very much about. Now, I do something a little bit different with this portrait. I infuse a contemporary story with a careful selection of emotional scenes from the 1830s. Mm. And indeed, for this excerpt, I've chosen one of these very scenes 
as I take you back to 1832, to Josephine Brancaster, she bravely tried to do the right thing for her and her love, Edith Hewitt. So buckle in, guard your hearts, as I take you back in time. September 1832, City Walk, Leicester. Edith, Edith, wait! Josephine pulled at Edith's sleeve. For pity's sake. Pity? How can you speak of pity? Edith tugged her sleeve free from Josephine's hold. You have a nun. And you have no sense. Wait. Josephine followed Edith after Edith, trying her best for her walking not to become running. Ladies did not run after all. Edith, on the other hand, seemed to find walking at a genteel pace, a torture she would not endure. Josephine could just see her head running, weaving through the crowds that gathered on City Walk for the much anticipated lighting of the first gas lamps. Edith! Josephine looked for Edith's shape amongst the pressing throng, so familiar, so loved. She felt her hands slip into hers. She felt Edith's lips warm against her ear. I do not need sense, and my heart tells me all I need to know. Edith lifted Josephine's hand against her chest. Please, Edith, I cannot be strong for both of us. We need to let each other go. Um, I, I kind of want to make a sort of meta question a little bit uh, and, and absolutely use your own experience here, but um, what, is, what do you think? I, I think whether or not you read a lot of romance, um, we all love romance, we all want romance. It's, it's a central part of our lives. Um, and I think that that's part of the appeal of it, um, or it's or it's the central part of what we want out of our lives. Um, and I think as as LGBTQ people, we more possibly even more define ourselves because of love, right? Who we love and who we don't love, and um, etc. So, um, as a, as a genre, however, I, I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think is the appeal of romance for? Because it is the most um, whether whether it's heterosexual, whether it's homosexual or it's bisexual, it is the most uh, read genre. Um, wh why do you think it's it's so appealing? Um, what was what is appealing to you as writers? I mean, both as readers and as writers. Um, why do you think it has that appeal? I can do. Um, I'm struggling though. Um, I because I don't read romance, which is interesting. Um, I I'm not one of those people that <laughs> that would buy. Um, a romance book that, that just advertises itself just as romance. Um, but then I do find myself, when I'm reading a book, wondering who's going to fall in love with who. I think it, it is just part of sort of being human, isn't it, that you, 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 a romance appeals. I guess, I was going to say escapism is part of it, that idealism of, of something that you want that isn't always there in your day-to-day -day life. I think that's one of the things that definitely appeals about romance. And I think uh, the, the point that Alan was making, actually, it's, it's safe, isn't it? You, you, you know you're gonna get you're gonna get that happy ending you, at some point you know they're gonna fall out but even when you're kind of following them down that dark hole they're probably gonna be okay again so I guess that if you are wanting to to just have a, a read and it's not gonna challenge you too much because you are you're on holiday or you're just having a nice relaxing day actually I can see why romance appeals um, I tend to read books that end in no closure and leave me just feeling traumatized so I suppose <laughs> <laughs> it's better not to always have that actually so. <laughs> In the audience, why do you buy a book? Do you buy it for the romance or do you buy it for the subject matter? So would you like to see more, like Bold Strokes for example, selling more or producing more um, theme-based work as opposed to romance? You know, books that, dare I even suggest it, might not have anybody getting together in them at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, <I'm not> <laughs> little, little resistance. Yeah, yeah. Is anybody um, in the? Is there anything that Bold Strokes isn't that isn't in their catalogue now that you, that you, if you know their catalogue, that you would like to see? That's just personal. Silence. Yes, I'm. When Radcliffe was here um, last year. She was talking about um, genres of books, and she asked that 200 or so people were there who reads, she likes space opera, who reads space opera. And I was the one person that put my hand up. 
And she said, that's why we don't publish very much. <laughs> so I would say, still say the same thing. I like space <laughs> opera. Yeah, I like space opera. C.J. Birch. Oh, good. Have, you read, have you read C.J. Birch? She actually writes space opera. She writes mm. the whole sorts of books. Her books are really good, but it's, it's pure space opera. The main character is like a Han Solo lesbian. It's fantastic. They're fantastic. What's it called? Her name is C.J. Birch. Yeah, she's great. So there is one. <laughs> Can we have more? I, I think the thing is with, um, with romance, it's, it's as you said, whether you're Whatever label or box you like to put yourself in, romance is the best selling genre. And whilst it's nice to sort of think, yes, let's have some space opera and, and let's have some, you know, polyamorous um, relationships in a space opera set in <laughs> a, a multicultural community with a disabled lead, ticking lots and lots and lots and lots of boxes. They, they don't sell. And at the end of the day, Bolstrokes Books needs to, to make money. Now, what is fabulous about Bolstrokes Books is you have the romance writers that sell this much on a bar chart, but they still then publish the fantasy writers and the sci-fi writers and the thriller writers that publish this much <laughs> and never make the investment back. A typical <laughs> book um, costs quite a lot of money to produce. Um, but these subgenres of what is already um, a small portion of the market don't make that money back. But Bold Strokes Books continues to publish them anyway because they feel those niches and those needs should be met, which is, which is fabulous because the, the big selling authors um, in terms of romance, the Melissa Braden, Georgia Beers, lots of others who would escape me, um, they prop us all up, effectively, and mean that we can still publish the stuff that we're passionate about um, and, the, and the stuff that we really want to write about, which I think is, is really unique and special. So, Bolstro, woo! Uh, 
yeah, I don't, I don't think that saying it's a formula means that it's easy. Um, it's quite difficult, and especially to do alone. I think, oh, I think in terms of, of the formula, as Aristotle said, there are new, new, no new stories. So in terms of the formula, you have to make your characters engaging. You have to make them new and interesting in ways that you haven't done before, which is how an author like Radcliffe can write 50 or 60 books that are romance, but you want to read everyone and everyone is, is slightly different in some way, uh, and the characters are different. For me personally, I, I can't write to the romance formula. Um, I'm, I'm a writer that writes from my heart and writes about things I'm passionate about. And I, so that means addressing plot issues in terms of uh, what happens if, so and what happens when, as opposed to the characters driving the book. So I ask the what if question, and then populate that, that world with characters that will drive that story, rather than thinking about a, you know, a, a pure romance uh, formula. So I can't, I can't do it, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I think romance readers would find me out. So I don't profess to be a pure romance writer because I know I'm not. Um, I can't write it as I would write my, my normal books. And as I say, romance readers would find me out because it's not, it's not uh, genuine, as it were. Uh, so I think that kind of answers the question. <laughs> I was going to say, in answer to your question, that I think all novels potentially follow formulas. Whatever genre you write, and there are very well, all novels follow formulas or can, like there are well established three act or three um, act formulas for every type of fiction writing and for plays and for screenwriting and everything. And I started off writing by the seat of my pants very much and I would just sit and write and the story would, would come to me and I'd plot a bit and write a bit and plot a bit and now I plot first and I do so much more craft I, to, I never get <laughs> I take so long I take much longer to write but what I write is so much more thoughtful and I have found in answer to your question that as challenging as it might be to keep to what is a formula, to at least try to be more crafted in the way that I write and more thoughtful in what I produce. And I edit so much more now than I ever edited to the relief of anybody who has to edit my work. <laughs> <laughs> and I, have, I do feel that that has helped me and it's helped me to become a better writer and I think a more interesting writer too. It's, it's taken away some of the fluidity and freshness probably of my writing, but it's much more thoughtful. So I think if I, if I was given a prison sentence where I had to write a romance to formula, that, I'd find that quite hard, that community service to have to, <laughs> have to carry out. But I'm sure if I did, I would learn I would learn something from it because that life is for learning. Yeah, I, 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 even though I write fiction, I think of myself as well as a writer. So in my time, that's how I feel. Um, I'm completely in love with writing Kirsty Logan. Um, if I heard of her, um, she, she had the poem lines. Um, she had short stories called The Red Heart of the Fairy Tales. She writes just beautifully and, and weird scenarios, people with, with um, interchangeable metal hearts and when someone breaks you can take it out and replace it. And I love that imagination. Um, and, and I think, uh, I feel that that's in me as well. So I would quite enjoy, as a writer, um, writing all kinds of quirky things. Um, but I do love my little romance. So. Just, I mean, just for me, um, it's quite interesting um, because that more or less happened to me. So I wrote four almost unintentional romances um, um, which sort of went through editing and everything else and have got a lot of history and other stuff in them. And then I talked to my editor who is absolutely wonderful and I've got a really good relationship with and she said, why don't you just write a romance? Everything you write is almost a romance. Why don't you just write one? And I went, well, I don't think I'm a romance writer. And she said, well, actually you are. And she sent me a kind of written formula for, for writing a romance, sort of some bullet points of do this, do this, do this, then do this, then do this, happy ever after. And, um, 
and funnily enough, I've not written a novel since. So <laughs> how, how I react to it, actually. Um, but, but what it has made me realise is that there is always a formula, and it's made me start exploring other formulas. I mean, you'll see them in like the writing section of bookshops, how to write a novel, and it'll be, there's this plot and there's this plot, and they're not all romance, there's other things as well. And a little bit like Quinn, actually, it's made me think, well, next time I write, I am going to think more about the craft of it. I'm not just going to blast out thousands of words, but it probably won't follow the romance formula. <laughs> Any last, last question? All right, well, thank you all so much.